good morning. Welcome to the Holly House. We are restored to the 1850s and 60s. This was the home of Reverend McCauley, a pastor of the church next door, St. Mary Magdalene. Uh, this house was his home, um, and because of his inheritance, uh, the property included about 500 acres, which was used as a working farm, although Macaulay's focus was more clerical. We were fortunate during the restoration to have found a Longford fireplace, and if you're interested in more information on how these are built, because they become quite popular these days, and what the physics are behind uh, its good draw, and why it is so popular. We also are fortunate to have the beehive oven that is attached. And this was where you would have done your heavy baking when you were doing all day bakes for your bread. We have a fire started, and the fire is critical to everything that we do in the hearth. Uh, how it um, works in terms of its development of coals, the amount of flame that hits the bottom of your pots, etc., are very important. It is something you learn over time, and people who spent years following their mother and then moving on to their own households would have learned the schedules and the techniques and the tricks of the trade. Uh, because to feed a whole family over a hearth is quite the trick. Um, once hearths were finished, and you can see from here, we did at one point have a stove. And uh, although stoves were the next development and certainly made life easier in many respects, uh, it was just as much work. Okay, we have two cranes, and these cranes have S hooks, and the distance across the crane and the number of chains gives you a lot of versatility in terms of having what you're cooking closer to or further away from the fire, depending on what it is you're doing. And the up and down with the hooks makes a great deal of difference when you're starting something and then you want to move it higher just to sit on it. We have um, tools that we'll talk about when we do our actual cooking because that will work into things better. Welcome to the Macaulay House Hearth Kitchen. Um, the house was restored and we were fortunate enough to have a Rumford fireplace with attached beehive oven, which we are still able to use and do as often as possible. Um, many of you um, may want to do some referencing. Uh, there are many things online, uh, but I suggest that you look at the writings of Catherine Carr Trail um, for information about what was going on in our area, and look up the culinary historians of Ontario and Canada who are experts on historical cooking. Um, there's also a series of books from the States called Foxfire that came out in the 70s where they documented actual people who were still living on their farms and they just divided up into sections uh, as to various chores, uh, including how to cook and preserve uh, that are very interesting. We had to have a fire going. In those days, it was really important that the fire was with you all the time. Uh, we are fortunate today that we could use matches. I'll bring my big kitchen matches tomorrow. So we want to have a bed of coals um, anywhere from four to eight inches. And the heat from those coal and the ash are something that stay with you through all of your cooking. You want to develop coals that you can cook with, and in the older times, uh, they would have had green wood for the cooking and dry wood for getting the fires going. If you organize your time, which was critical in those days, 
um, because you had to do things step by step. And um, if this is all that you relied upon and you were doing all your cooking, uh, how you used the fire was very important. And oftentimes, it was necessary to use your bellows in order to get things going. things about a room for the fireplace, which is in my notes, but it's an aside, um, is the draw. This fireplace was developed specifically um, for its draw, and that's another one of those things that you can find online. We will jump to the end of the day. When you're finished cooking, it's important to lay ash on top of your coal to keep your coals going, um, especially if you're cooking every day. Uh, another one of those things can hold you up dramatically is if you get up in the morning and you have no coal to start the next day's fire. And often um, you would have to run to a neighbor with your tin bucket and gather your coals in order to start your fire anew. Pots that were available to you in those days were in the main cast iron. And we have a couple of different soup pots. These cast iron pots have a dome lid, and you would put your cooking inside, be it a soup or meat. And the purpose of the dome lid. Uh, this one actually says drip top, is that the condensation from your cooking develops on the lid and comes back down onto the food so that things do not dry out and that you can keep um, your soup and your meats well hydrated. One of your cooking, quick cooking is a griddle. You can do biscuits, you could do your bacon if you didn't have a fry pan. Um, nearly anything that doesn't need to be baked can be cooked on your griddle. There are fry pans of different kinds and small griddles. This one could be used for cooking a soup or a stew. Uh, but it can also be used for baking. And it has a lid. So again, similar to the drip pot, you'd be able to have your condensation. But if you're using it for baking, you can put coals top and bottom. This is probably the workhorse of the kitchen. It is called a Dutch oven. And if you had nothing else, this would do you well. It has a few legs so that you can put fire underneath. And again, you can put the fire on the top. We're fortunate here at Macaulay to have a double set of cranes. And we have a series of S-hooks, as you can see, which allow you to raise and lower your pots closer or further away from the fire as your cooking method requires. And we can also slide them left and right so that you are right over the fire if you need it or when you spread your coals if you're Doing two or three things that are hanging, you can move your simmering pot off to one side, put your griddle in the middle, and cook something else on the other side.
In the older kitchens and farm kitchens, you often had just one large crane that would come quite far out into the room. And because those fireplaces tended to be larger and didn't necessarily have the draw that this one does, um, you needed to be well away from the fire. When you're using the pots with the bales, They're the ones that work that way. There are other times when you want to cook outside the firebox. And in that case, you have a couple of different methods. One is to put something on a trivet. <clears throat> You might well want to do if you're frying, and again, you put your fire and coals underneath the trivet and keep moving coals underneath the trivet until you have finished doing your cooking. As you can see, all of this requires much bending over. <laughs> One of the reasons for having a higher bit of coals can be that it's a lot easier on your back because you can keep your fire and your coals a little higher up. When you're working with the griddle, As with all the pieces you're using, you'll want to preheat. And one of the tricks with the griddle, uh, which tends to gather grease quite easily, is that you rub it down with salt between uses. And the salt pulls away the grease and uh, gives you a good cooking surface in the end. Oftentimes you're using flour as a base, whereas we would use a lot of shortening and oil these days. And again, the salt works well on the top of the cast iron. You use very little soap and water on cast iron when you're using it. And all of the companies that make cast iron will have uh, instructions on how to season. And if you go on to YouTube, there are any number of cooks who have various and sundry ways of seasoning their cast iron. And at the moment, one of the things that's interesting is that there's a group of people who figure that you season at a very low temperature, and then there are still the people who figure you have to be at 4 or 450. Mm -hmm. um, I found when I was re-seasoning the bake pot the other day, that on the low temperature, unless you've done an absolutely excellent job of laying the oil and then wiping it away, when you're seasoning at the lower temperature, it gums up. So I would suggest the higher temperature, I would be on that spectrum. Like I said, the Dutch oven is meant to sit on the hearth but I have found over time, uh, and because I haven't cooked every day for years, that when you have the heat of the pot, if you're putting things straight onto the metal, you have to be very careful about how you're dealing with your heat. Because if the bottom of your pot on the fire is too hot, you're gonna scorch and burn. So I often take a couple of bricks, and after the pot has been heated, I will put it on the trivet as it's a little higher, put the bricks in, and then use a tin baking pan. Put the lid back on, and as you do with this style pot, bring the coals onto the top. And at that 
point, you will have an oven and anything that you would normally bake in your home oven for 20 minutes will normally come out this way. So we're going to be doing biscuits this time around, uh, but we have done cornbread, soda breads, um, etc. And pies are something that are a little tricky. So when we do the apple crisp tomorrow, uh, and we do it over the fire, it will be interesting to see. There will be things that will stick to cast iron, especially if your pot is really hot and your coals are right to it. And they had a couple of utensils uh, <laughs> that worked very well. This one is made out of little metal rings, and you can rub it on the bottom, and it'll help take those bits that have burnt on away. Uh, something even simpler, broom corn bundle makes an excellent struggle. Once you have cleaned out the pot and you have wiped it down well, you will oil it again and then put it aside ready for its next purpose. When you're using your fry pan and your griddle, as much fun as it is to cook over the fire, ash is always an issue. And one of the ways that they solve that on top of the food and on the purpose, on the cast iron, excuse me, um, was to just use something as simple as a feather. The importance of the ash and the coal to the cooking process. And um, we are using dry wood, and I am pleased that it is not burning away as quickly as I was afraid it might. Uh, green wood would be better if you were going to be cooking all day as it creates a much better coal that holds so that when you're moving those coals either between the bricks or underneath your trivet or you're setting a pan on it, um, you're not having to replenish continuously. Um, but I will have to put some ash up over the coal uh, in order to try and maintain some of that heat so that when we start again tomorrow, uh, we are not uh, taking as much time to develop our cooking surface. As important things that we have talked about is the importance of coals in the cooking process. These remnants that hold so much heat, especially when you're using um, green wood as opposed to dry, are critical when you bring it underneath and then have your pots on top or under the spider. Uh, we want them to hold for as long as they can so that you're not continuously replenishing, losing heat and then bringing it back up again. that hopefully are still there and um, you might find that the vegetables need to be paired a little bit differently than we would today because once they've been stored for a while you'll find that things will tend to rot or the skins will begin to get a bit scarred and it's not like going into your local grocery store uh, 
and we would certainly save all of the pairings if we still had any animals that we needed to feed, or we would redo that into potentially a vegetable stock. So I will um, be using our dome lid pot. I'm going to pop her up onto the crane and just get it going. And it has been sitting next to the fire, and already, it, except for the bale, it is pretty hot. So we'll get some onions ready. Fairly simple soup. It will be made with water, not stock. Okay, we have the vegetables and the water, the onions and the rosemary. We'll pop on the lid, put her back onto the heat, and it'll look after itself. We are in maple syrup time, so I thought I would demonstrate some maple biscuits for you that we have enjoyed making in the past. Um, they will not be doing a large maple festival this year, but I understand that all the vendors will be open. And one of the ingredients in this recipe is maple sugar. And we source this maple sugar from uh, Sweetwater Cabin, which is owned by uh, one of our curators and her husband. I have pre-measured the flour, the baking powder, some sugar, a bit of salt, and I am adding, in this case, shortening. They would have used lard in the day much more often than we do now. There is a difference in flavor when you're cooking with the lard as opposed to the shortening. So like with all biscuit recipes, you want to cut your shortening into the flour until it forms little beads. Today we have those nice cutters that we use, but two forks or your fingers um, would certainly work quite well. And I'm going to slip the fingers. The board that I'm working on is has been created particularly for working with pastries and flowers and, and baking materials. Uh, your rim keeps you from overshooting and dirtying more of your table than is necessary. Okay, you can see that that's beginning to blend. See how the shortening is moved in with the flour. Okay. I want to double check how my turtle is going. I'll move it a little bit over. At this point, like we talked about previously, organization and scheduling, uh, especially if you're doing things for the family, or a crowd, which, although this family was often just two, um, when it came time to have visitors, uh, they could well have had a house full, as when Reverend Macaulay's brother John and his children and wife came. I'm adding milk to make a soft dough. You'll notice I have some cups on the table. Uh, when we have school programming, we remind children uh, that they wouldn't have had all the graduated measuring units that we had. So you would be actually using a cup for a cup. Uh, and you would be using teaspoons and tablespoons like you would use at the table. Okay. okay we'll gather that together. Waste 
I'm going to put maple syrup between a number of layers before we get this baking. You can use rolling pins. Uh, I tend to use my fingers. See how fine that sugar is. Okay, and we will fold that over, make a layer. One of the reasons for making this in a flat unit that you cut on, instead of cutting it into biscuits is that you don't have to do any re-rolling re of the dough. One more time. We'll get to about half an inch, I think. And we'll cut these into just some rough squares. Is to remember that you've put these on and that as you're moving on to the next bit of cooking that you need to check periodically. We will move these around and turn them until they are done. And I don't know if you can see the layers here or the nuts. And we're going to move on to biscuits that will go with the soup. Uh, they will be cooked in the bake pot. I have set the pot up on a couple of bricks. Um, it has been in front of the fire preheating. And I am going to dump my pan on a brick. So that hopefully I don't 
don't burn the bottoms <laughs> today. We have begun to develop those coals we were talking about. And I'm going to want to get those under the pot. We're also going to do the apple crisp today, and we'll be using the fry pan with lid and the spider. So bring that closer to the fire. Bring our coals underneath. We have apples, into which we're going to put, again, maple sugar for sweetening. Give that a bit of a dressing. in the bottom of the pot. And you can see at this point I'm still able to use my hands. Plenty of heat under there at this point. Put our lid on. Spread that out just a little bit more. Check our biscuits. We are just beginning to get some color. And I have to be careful that I don't lose my cooler layers. Do a little dancing around. And back they go. Just from time to time we get these lovely puffs of smoke. And uh, that's our romantic idea of the flavor of cooking over the open fire. It can be very pleasant, but again, it has to be tempered. I'm just going to put a little more coal under that pot. And we'll start our biscuit.
We are flour, cream of tartar, salt, sugar, uh, and baking soda in this particular mixture. And this time we are using butter. Another one of those staples in any home farm or city. Again, we'll cut the butter in initially and then I'll move to my fingers. The harder the butter, the better the mixture. In talking with some others who are doing baking these days, uh, we're finding that there seems to be more liquid in the butter, which is changing. Uh, product. Even with the heat of this fire, we still have cold butter. <laughs> more shortening in this mixture than there was in the maple sugar. So we will have a, a richer biscuit. Okay, that looks pretty good. Feels good. With practice, everything is done by touch. We have a half a cup of milk and an egg for liquid this time. And I have put the egg in the milk. You can see the difference in color when you add egg as well. as little as possible. Like with all of these, the more you work it, the tougher it gets. It's a tiny bit sticky at this point, but by the time I've rolled it out with flour, it will have tightened up a bit. Again, you can roll these, but I prefer using my hands. Just straight sides. A good dozen there so far. We will gather the rest of the, the dough and continue. These are going underneath the pot. And we still have certainly the heat of the fire. Alright. Oh. Well, then to 
your feet. So I am, we definitely have plenty of heat. I'm definitely going to keep the brick there. Put in my tin can. Center my biscuits. Fill up my lid. And it will put coals on the top. We will leave that for a little while. My, my maple biscuits are really opening up. You can certainly see the layers this time. Ah, color's even better. Pop those over. Move those back. We will double check our apples. And that is now definitely hot. I'm using a fireproof glove for safety purposes. Oh, look at that. They are really, really nicely cooking down. And look at all the condensation that we've dropped onto the heart. Okay, we'll put the topping on. There's a lot more liquid there than I thought we would have today. Estimate the heat that the cast iron pots hold. You can't see the smoke coming off of it and the bubbles. Okay. It's coming along very nicely. That will be ready for supper, no, no question. Try. 
You can tell me if they're cooked inside. That's the what I'm looking for at the moment. You can certainly see the flies. I'm happy with that. Really happy with that. That one looks like it may be a little soft in the middle. Okay, thank you. Take a quick peek at these and see whether they're ready or overdone. Oh, I would say mm. those are done. Oh, those are beautiful. I think we'll do another batch since we seem to have enough heat. Top and bottom. When you're cooking on other than your full baking day, when you're using the beehive oven, having the bake pot available is just a blessing because you can get quite a few things done in not too much time. And the color and the aroma are exactly what you're looking for. Pack them in a little bit more this time. All right. And I am presuming that there is enough residual heat here that I shouldn't have to add any more coals at this particular point in time. We will try and see. And we'll see if, we, if the apples have cooked away. That's beginning to... That has reduced quite sufficiently and you can see that there's not the liquid that there was previously, so it is doing well as well. So we don't need any additional heat on that. So let's bring the apple crisp up. something that we won't have over the video. But you can see that it's just beginning to caramelize on the bottom. And the top has soaked up a lot of the maple sugar. So, we are complete. Here's our dessert. Mm -hmm.